UK Crime Book Club. It's Friday night and we are live with Louise Candlish. I mean, exciting. Hi. Exciting Friday night stuff. Um, Louise, hello, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about The Only Suspects? Absolutely, yeah. So it looks like this if you haven't seen it on the shelves yet. And it is um, a bit of a departure for me in that one of the strands is what I learn is considered historical in that it's set in 1995, in which is not, that's five. not ancient history to me, let me tell you, that's, that's you know, it feels like yesterday. Um, but yeah, so half of it's set in 1995 and half is set in the present day. And um, there's a link between the two strands, you'll be pleased to know. But basically, it's a very noirish, um, moody thriller involving um, crimes committed in 1995 that come back to haunt the characters in the present day. Um, and we open in the present day with the narrator, Alex, um, who's living a kind of recognizably one of my um, characters' lifestyles in a, in a beautiful cottage in the suburbs, really leafy. He's probably got hydrangeas in his garden and he's got a lovely wife called Beth. And um, his, his wife called Beth, is um, very active in the community and the, um, the, the thriller opens with her um, breaking the news to Alex that they've had the go ahead for a nature trail to be landscaped on a disused railway line behind their houses. And obviously this is a huge coup for the, for the neighbourhood. It's really going to be fantastic for, you know, both for their um, quality of life and also their house prices. Mm -hmm. But Alex is um, completely thrown and behaving very oddly at this news. And we soon learn that he is, it's more than just, you know, a distaste for eco-warrior activities. He's got some serious secrets that he's kept hidden related to that trail. And um, he's going to, you know, sort of go to any lengths to protect the truth from coming out. Who'd have thought a nature trail could be so problematic? I oh, know. <laughs> There's always something sinister, you know, no matter how bucolic the setting, that's what I find. <laughs> We've already got quite a few hellos, so hello everyone. Hello, hello. Samantha, Cal, Caroline, Laura, Karen. Lovely. Hi from South Wales, somebody says hello Karen oh, as wow. well. This is great. Um, oh, that's Samantha. Samantha, hello from South Wales. Hello from no. uh, hello to South Wales. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the first things when I was reading The Only Suspect that really, really made me laugh, and it's really early on, and I wrote it down, um, typical 30 and 40 something <laughs> mums, which was to say committed to the point of psychotic. I <laughs> That's a good line. Yeah. That line. <laughs> absolutely brilliant uh, do you know funny. what this is, I, that's a brilliant a brilliant um um uh, first question or second question do you know what that uh, where that remark came from it was actually my husband describing our dog's behavior in the park he was like oh he chased the ball for an hour he was committed to the point of psychotic i immediately wrote it down i just thought what a brilliant description because people are like that as well as dogs you know? <laughs> I frequently have to tell myself to calm down, you know, like just just ease off a little bit. I'm very enthusiastic. Yeah. So as a forty-something, I was like, that just <laughs> the fact that that's about dogs chasing balls says a lot, doesn't it? That I resonated with that one line. No, definitely, and there you do get that. I mean, I know myself from you know being in parenting circles that there is a thin line between you know being really passionate about your child's you know your ambitions for your for your kids. And, um, and you know, but actually becoming a bit deranged about it. And <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that, I love that you picked out that line. That's one of my favourites. It's absolute genius. Um, I think that's really funny. <laughs> Does your husband often come out with things like this? Do we need to Yeah, he's very funny. Yeah, no, he is funny. He's, um, we're both very um, sardonic. And I think we're both really typically Gen X. Um, which for anyone too young to know what that means, means that you're basically in your late 40s or early 50s. And, um, you know, and from from that 90s kind of, you know, those those hedonistic days of the 90s, we all grew up in a kind of culture where you could, you know, you mocked and you bantered and you said what you liked and you called a spade a spade. And, you know, we're, uh, this gen is really coming to terms with, you know, the new ways 
of um you know being incredibly sensitive about everything and trying to figure out whether you're going to offend anyone but within the safe space of my own home with my husband we're really rude and um and you know constantly um saying withering things about people <laughs> I'm glad my husband doesn't write down the things that I come out with <laughs> Well, he probably does. Maybe you'll find a little notebook and you'll see. But it will be flattering. I think it's flattering. If, whenever, if, if anyone ever sees a phrase of theirs in one of my books, you know, take it as a compliment because, um, you know, only the best ones get get put in there. <laughs> now, when we opened, um, just for anyone who was still signing in at that point, you mentioned that this is the first time, I can't believe we're using the phrase historical about the 90s, but this is the first kind of time that you've used historical, a dual timeline of historical and yeah, quite I yeah, a few years ago. I where get past the words of historical for it. I know, yeah. What could we say? I mean, it's kind of um, you know, it, it is it's deeper in the past than usual. I mean, often I'll have um, a similarish structure. So something like our house, for instance, and, and the other passenger both have a structure where there's there's events, you know, quite catastrophic, quite catastrophic events happening on, you know, in the present day across one day or a weekend or a short period of time. And then you might go back a year or a couple of years, fill in the backstory and see, mm. you know, how you reach the point of these catastrophic events. Gosh, I can't, I can't speak this evening. I haven't even <laughs> got on the wine yet. I'm Maybe water, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. I think I've made the made the wrong decision to go dry for this interview. Um, but yes, um, so there will I will often do the the dual timeline, but they're usually much closer together, and then you see them join up. And my favourite bit when I'm writing that kind of structure is when they join up, and it mm. starts to feel like, oh, this is this feels quite clever. Before that, it's like you know they you know it's, it's a puzzle, it's putting in the pieces. Um, but then when you actually reach the, reach the point where where they join up, you can start to see exactly how to polish it and refine it. And I love that bit. How different was it going back further, though, with this dual timeline to the 90s? Um, well, it was first of all, it was necessary because the plot that I wanted to do, um, without giving too much away, there's there's a central deception. Yeah. Um, and the crimes in and around that deception simply couldn't take place in the digital age. They could the moment you introduce mobile phones, the whole deals off basically um and you know they could all just look at look each other up on social media and you know it's, it's game over so i needed to go pre mobile phones really i need people to be moving in that very free and anonymous way that we did um mm. before we tracked each other Thank and goodness. you know yeah and it was um so so um, so that was the reason for doing it. Otherwise, I could have done it, you know, any time. Mm. But then once I decided to do that, and once I'd, I'd um, targeted 1995 as my year, um, it just involved a lot more research um, than usual. Because mm. even though I was an adult then, and, you know, I consider that very much my era, it was surprising how little I could remember of it um, because, like, you know, I'd be, like the characters in the book, like Rick and Rollo and Marina, you know, I was partying a lot. I wasn't really paying attention to things like, you know, what time the buses started running or um, what kind of trainers people wore or, you know, what time the tube started in the morning and, um, you know, kind of all, all you know, where, where you bought a sandwich at lunchtime. It was all that kind, all those little details um needed researching so that mm. that's highly unusual for me because I'm not really interested in research and um I'm much more interested in getting on with writing and you know developing the the plot and the characters and so I did have to slow down and read up a little bit on um the details and actually in the end with all research I um I end up using a fraction of what what yeah. I've got but I just needed to feel for it to feel authentic in my head before I started delving in and you know I could remember some things I mean they that I lived in Camden where the characters lived so you know I could remember the pubs I could remember you know they go to Ruby in the Dust which is a cafe on the high street that I used to go to all the time I think they might go to the um, Good Mixer I can't remember where they go now actually or Delancey's um, there are quite a few places that I didn't have to really think about too hard mm. because I could remember it and in Covent Garden where they they um, have a drink in the Lamb and Flag. That's one of my old haunts. Just going to blow my nose, sorry. Um, and um, where else? Victoria. Like, yeah, I mean, there, some of it I could remember, um, and, but a lot of it I couldn't. 
Um, so that was the big difference, really. But it also was wonderful. And I felt so happy writing that strand. I felt full of nostalgia for, mm. a, you know, a simpler time, even though I was crafting a, you know, quite a dark plot. Um, and, you know, not everyone survives 1995, I think we could say, <laughs> in, um, without giving too much away. I did, I just... I just fell in love with with those characters and that strand, and so actually, it's you know one of the, the most enjoyable things I've I've ever written. I think. And um, one of the things I noticed you asked on Twitter um, a short while ago was um, with the casting. I'm going to talk a little bit about the TV and all the different things you've done, but you were asking people to cast um, the swimming pool and the only suspect. So. And congratulations, they have both been optioned. Yes, so they have, kind of yes. Ahead. So yeah. has anyone come up with an idea that you've been really excited by yet? I can't even remember that interchange. So I think we're getting a theme here that I've obviously <laughs> got a mind like a sieve. I remember someone had some really good ideas for the swimming pool, actually, didn't they, which I've now forgotten. Um, but with the, with the only suspect, I think, um, um, I, I guess the, the younger characters rick and rollo i mean we'll, we'll have different cast for the mm. older group than than the 20 somethings it's not one of those ones where i think you can have someone playing yeah. um you know pretending to be younger and then pretending to be older i don't think that would work um but you know what i was thinking what about bringing back rupert penry jones to play mm. alex he was um he was um toby in our yeah. house and um and he was kind of playing against type very much in that. And he was just so unsettling, I thought. Mm. Um, and um, it just gave me a real sense of his range. And Alex is a really complex character for those who haven't read the book yet. You know, you're never really quite sure. And I wasn't really quite sure oh, whether he's a goodie or a baddie. Know. Yeah, I mean, I... I I'm always very drawn to these male narrators mm. who um, have got a very dark side. Um, and, you know, I just think, you know, when you go that whole tradition of um, the talented Mr. Ripley, Tom Ripley, and, you know, there, there have been a lot of characters in literature where they're, you know, they're psychos or they're criminals, but we're somehow we're cheering for them and, we, you know, we're kind of rooting for them to get away with it. And there's an element of that to Alex. Mm. Um, and he's just so... Um, relentlessly um, sardonic and dark um, in this kind of, you know, perfect suburban world where everyone's, you know, sort of really performatively parenting and, um, you know, sort of having their Aperol spritzes on e in each other's gardens and, you know, just really loving their their lives. And he's he's just, he's just so under the radar he just doesn't want to take part in that don't know how I got onto that but yes um but yes I can imagine Rupert Penry Jones nailing him I really can um but honestly we're nowhere near that stage where um mm. it's um it was unusual in that it was optioned before it came out but um before it was published because normally that you know there's the books out there and people you know see it on the shelves before it gets optioned but it because it's the same team as our house they had yeah. an early read um and so um so yeah we're very early in the in the process and you know ultimately it's not it, it won't be my my decision about casting anyway it's the, it's the broadcasters um you know they'll choose their stars for when you're saying Rupert Henry Jones it's different than his usual kind of you know the characters he'd normally play that must be really interesting for him but how about for you writing such a, a wide range of characters all of your characters are very distinctive from each other you know that must be fun for you it must be challenging yeah. as well yeah well it is I mean I um I'm glad you think they're all distinctive because sometimes <laughs> I think oh god do they all do they all sound the same also I don't do a, a huge amount of um describing my characters physically I'm just one of those authors that I mean some some books I read I the descriptions are so amazing and you mm. and it makes me think oh maybe I need to describe what people are wearing more um I was just reading a book where where every character you know what they're wearing and it's and you, and you don't you you know more about their clothes than you sort of do about their physical attributes and I think that's a really clever way of giving details of a character yeah. um 
but yes, I um, I hope they're distinctive. Um, and but you know, generally there will be you know there'll be recognisable characters mm. in in my books. In this one, there's there's there is a new type of character, and that is the pregnant, the evil pregnant woman, Zara. Zara, yeah. Um, who I noticed online they were they were calling evil pregnant homeless woman which I think is is what um Alex calls her um and um you know I've I, I just thought it was time to have an evil pregnant person in a book because um they're always so good and we're always you know we're, they're treated with kid gloves and you know quite rightly you should we should treat pregnant women very well but I thought it would be really fun if um she was really horrible <laughs> And she is very kind of, um, you know, she's a she's quite a sinister character um, for those who haven't started the book yet. Mm -hmm. We've got two kind of triangles. So the one in 1995 is Rick and Rollo, who are flatmates, and then Rick's girlfriend, Marina, and the three of them mm -hmm. spend quite a lot of time together. Then in the present day, we've got Alex and Beth in their lovely cottage. And then we've got Beth's friend, Zara, who's pregnant and homeless and split up with the father of her child, nowhere to live, and Beth invites her to join them in the cottage in the spare room. Um, and within moments, she and Alex, you know, have got this, this mutual antipathy. And she's really good at pushing his buttons. She, you know, she quite quickly spots that he's got something to hide. <laughs> and she's no fool. And she, you know, puts two and two together and she starts making accusations. And, you know, the, as she does that, he's growing, you know, sort of less and less in control. Um, and, um, you know, they're kind of on this collision course. But um, as with, as often with characters who mm. are, um, you know, suffering a crisis, you're never quite sure how much is, is really her trying to give him a hard, ti hard time and how much is, you know, his paranoia and interpreting everything she does and says, um, you know, as an accusation when in fact, you know, maybe, if you saw events from her point of view, it, it might play out very differently. And so I had a lot of fun with um, that trio. Um, and of course, Beth just wants them to get on. And, yeah. you know, it's we all know, know that situation. I remember reading that great Mark Edwards book where the in-laws arrive to stay for a weekend and then they never leave. What was it called? Here to Stay, yes. And they're, 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 I love that book. Now that's set, set really close to where I live as well, <laughs> um, up in West Dulwich. Um, but yeah, I really love that idea that, um, you know, she's at first he thinks it's just for a couple of weeks and it might actually be quite a good distraction because he's got, you know, um, far more important things to worry about than her. And then gradually he's like, when's she going? And, you know, of course, you can't throw out, you know, throw someone out when they're about to give birth. I mean, you, you shouldn't really be throwing someone out when they haven't got anywhere to live. But she's, you know, she's a vulnerable person, you know, as yeah. well. Um, and so um, I just really enjoyed building the tension of that. Um, so, yes, I guess there were a few sort of slightly newer, newer types of character. Marina, who is the, um, the main female character, she, I would say, is in my tradition of, um, you know, Hitchcock heroine femme fatale types she's uh, she's she's got echoes of melia in the um the other passenger mm -hmm. but she um isn't quite so clever and um she's a bit more you know she's used by people whereas melia is you know absolutely the kind of um conductor of her symphony um i think marina's um a little bit more of a sort of lost soul um so yes, so so I guess she was a little departure as well. Um, she's a very um, mysterious character, as readers will find. Quite funny that I've got here to stay from by Mark Edwards behind me. I mean, that's um, just weird, isn't it? We obviously have the same taste in books, don't we? <laughs> could do with a little bit of a, a tidy it's up like of things, you were a but, magician. Yeah. You could you could have plucked any book. As soon as you started talking slot, about yeah. it, I was like, I know exactly what this book is. It is an amazing book. Absolutely it's really good. It. Yeah, it's yeah. a really good. And you have a really part. nice quote from Mark Edwards, actually, I saw. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We do um, quote on each other's books. There's actually fantastic camaraderie with the, among the, the psychological thriller writers. Yeah. You know, real mutual respect. But more than that, actually, we do really love each other's books. Um, you know, I have that sort of mutual thing with quite a few um, authors. And it's just so nice, you know, you look for, there's certain authors where you just look from, you know, we're just like any reader, you look forward yeah. to 
to um, the new one from your auto buys. And um, so Mark's definitely one of those for me. Yeah, Kaz calls them her shut up and take my money authors. <laughs> you see their name and that's it. Oh, I discovered something in my research <laughs> that I had missed and I'm really excited and I wrote down the title of it. And um, the skylight, the quick read, I've not read Oh it. yes. Oh so wow. Tell us how oh, you got okay. involved with that because I love for anyone who hasn't heard about quick reads, tell us a little bit about it because they are brilliant. They really are. They're, it's a scheme, an adult literacy scheme run by the reading agency. Um, and I think in, originally it was um, funded by the government and of recent years it's been funded by Jojo Moyes privately. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure who's funding the next batch, but they are novellas and they are written by best-selling authors um, and they're published by your own publisher. Um, and you write them um, in a kind of not a simple style, but in a much more direct way. Um, and there's a, an, so they're for, for people who are either um, picking up reading, having not read for years and years and years, or people who have never quite attained full adult literacy and so are um, improving, improving readers. That's, that's the easiest way of, of saying it. And you can improve very quickly by reading things like quick reads. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, they're stocked in libraries and schools and prisons, I think, and, you know, all the, all the places where there might be a community um, that didn't finish education or, or, you know, stopped reading a bit earlier. Um, so, yes, I was asked to do one and I'd actually hoped to do one. That had been one of my career ambitions because I'd read quite a few of them. There's a fantastic one by Claire Macintosh called The Donor. I've actually read several of them for, you know, for pleasure. Mm. Um, and so I was just really thrilled to be asked. I was asked by the um, Fanny Blake who was commissioning that particular series. Um, and yeah, and um, she just gave me some good advice. She just said, just think of it as 10 chapters with 2000 words. Um, something something happens in each chapter to move it forwards. There's one plot, there's, you, there's, you don't have subplots. Um, and then once once you've finished it, there's a consultant who goes through it and um, checks the um, just checks that it's 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 fluent and readable. So you wouldn't have complicated clauses. And actually, mm -hmm. when I when I read my normal um, writing, um, it makes me realise how complicated my clauses are. And I'm a great fan of of brackets. I have lots of asides. I have lots of um, dashes, I have lots of commas, mm. um, and I have lots of short sentences as well, but sometimes if I'm following someone's thought, I almost do it stream of consciousness. Um, and But you can't do anything like that, No, yeah. none of that in a quick read. It's all very direct, and it actually is a fantastically instructive experience for a writer. It really made me, a bit like screenwriting has done as well, actually, it's made me look at the the, the novels and the pacing of the novels with a much sharper eye and just made me think, oh, I'm, you know, I mustn't be too self-indulgent. Yes, it's quite nice to, you know, go down that blind alley, but, you know, I'm, I need to keep things moving. So it was, um, it was really good fun. But actually the story, I, I, I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to just give some second best idea for this because it's shorter and I'm not being paid lots of money, etc. I thought I'm going to give it one of my best ideas. Um, and I'd had this idea on the back burner for a while about a woman who um, lives in the top floor flat and um, she can see through the skylight into this sort of fantastically posh kitchen extension of the ground floor flat. And she, you know, starts to watch this couple, um, again, quite Hitchcocky, and she starts mm -hmm. to watch this couple. Um, and she, you know, she's got a few issues in her personality and she's not very confident and she's, you know, not particularly talented or beautiful. She feels very um, insecure. But this couple are glamorous and the girl is beautiful. And, you know, it seems like they've got this incredibly um, sociable and sexy life and often having dinners and drinks around this table under the skylight. Um, yeah. And then one day, I can't remember her name. I think she's called Simone. Um, just pluck that from from the, the depths of my. Um, We've got a few memory. people watching, so if you're wrong, I'm sure somebody will. Tell yeah, us. yeah. <laughs> oh yes, the skylight was wonderful, and the whole thing a fabulous initiative. Oh, that yes, completely agree, Marion. The lovely Marion Todd. Yeah, yeah, I, I recognise that name. Um, yeah, so um, so one day Simone is um, she's kind of addicted to watching. Um, it's it's basic. She's a voyeur. 
um, you know, a bit like people who set up secret cameras. That's basically what it is, because I should have mentioned that they don't know that she can see them because she's got this privacy glass. <clears throat> um, she can see them, but they can't see her. Oh, so, you know, a real one. trope. Yeah. But one day when she's looking down there, she sees something that makes her very angry and she um, she reacts. She overreacts um, to it. And I'll say no more. <laughs> I look forward to reading it. I really do like the quick reads. I think it's um, sometimes if I've read, you know, a really involved story beforehand and, you know, they're often kind of 400 and plus pages, the books that we're yeah. reading. Um, sometimes it's nice. It's almost a palate cleanser. Yes, absolutely. You know, rather than That's jumping a great into another it. big book. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So I agree. And, in the evening. Yes, yeah. Or if, yeah, it's all a train journey or... Um, you know, they just slot into your life really well. And, and you know, physically, they kind of slot into your bag as well because mm. they're light and, and slim. Yeah. Um, no, I completely agree. I, I read them in the bath, actually. But they're good ones to read at, um, you know, at bedtime because they're short, quite short chapters and they're bite size. It's just, yeah. they just really, it's they're not just for improving readers. They're for all of us, I think. I just love yeah, them. I completely agree, yeah. I've read um, quite a few now. Um, the Cutting Room by Mike Craven, um, The Black Mountain by Kate Moss, beautiful. And I didn't Ooh. think I'd heard about um, quick reads. I thought it was quite a new thing to me. And then in an old, um, in a on an, a shelf, when I was sorting my office out, I found one that I'd had of Kate Moss's from years ago. Oh wow! The name escapes me now. So that was a that was a nice find. Yeah, that's um, brilliant. I think sometimes they are um, sold in supermarkets. Actually, I mean they are on sale, and they, yeah, you'll you, see or in uh, WH Smith or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Laura's no, saying brilliant. Um, she won the set in the twenty twenty set, and it helped her encourage her mum to start reading for pleasure again. Wonderful. I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah, it really is. Because you forget we're, you know, so many of us are avid readers, you know, we've been bookworms all our life. And you just, you, it's hard to, to sort of relate to this yeah. idea that you, someone might be embarrassed that they can't read that well, or that they, you know, they sort of left school with a reading age of 10 or something, you know, it's very hard for us to, to, to relate to that. But um but so many people, I, I mean, I used to know the stats when I was doing publicity for, for the Skylar. I knew the stats, but, you know, they were they were staggering, yeah. the stats of how many people, um, you know, aren't aren't um, confident readers. So so it's just they, they, it's great. It's a great scheme. Yeah. Long may it continue. Absolutely. Um, Donna said that Mike Craven said he found the quick reads difficult to write because of the strict rules. She's asking if you found that. So Mike was saying things like you couldn't have words of over three syllables and um, you had to really think carefully about yeah. the choice of language. You know, you couldn't use a word like antique, for example. You'd need something that was easier to break down. Well, I didn't think about it too deeply when I was writing it. And that had been the advice that Fanny, the commissioning editor, had given me. She just said, just write a book. Mm. Um, and um, and then when you go over it and when we go over it, we will point out the words that are too difficult yeah. um, or the, the syntax that's too complicated. Um, but just get it down. And so so I didn't get too tied up in worrying about that. And um, and actually, the, the edit was quite light in the end. There weren't, um, because you didn't have that many words, you didn't sort of want to waste a word. So, you know, I didn't have yeah. complicated descriptions or anything. It was all, I kept the sentences quite short. And I, you know, I knew to avoid my, my long, um, you know, sort of sarcastic asides in brackets um, and stuff like that. So, um, but no, I didn't find it problematic at all. I, I found it quite freeing actually mm. but of course every writer responds differently some you know to different rules we don't like rules generally so i, <laughs> I understand what, what he meant <laughs> um what do you get asked most asked about the most by readers is it your books or is it bertie <laughs> bertie <laughs> <laughs> I'm tell everyone who bertie is books, but yeah bertie is my um favorite little little friend he's my um fox red labrador and he's often Beautiful. in my social media he's really lovely and it's amazing that he's not head butting open the door and coming to to sit here with me but i try and keep him i try and keep him out when i'm um, doing stuff like this because he you know he's quite sort of um you know he'll, he'll literally could knock me over 
and <laughs> he's very he's very athletic. I'm mocked by my daughter because um, I once um, described him as being a gifted athlete, and that's now passed into a catchphrase among her friends. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> they obviously think I'm committed to the point of psychotic about him. <laughs> We've got a running joke in my house. I don't know that I've shared this before and I'm regretting starting it already. A few years ago, I ordered um, a new dining table, but it wasn't a new one. It was from, I can't remember where it was from, um, one of the, it might have been eBay or somewhere. And it was marketed as this lovingly handcrafted table that had been in this farmhouse in this family for, you know, for years. And now the kids have all grown up and we want to, you know, pass it on to another family. And I really fell in love with this idea of this table and they dropped it off. And underneath when I was cleaning it, there was an Ikea stamp. <laughs> so now this is kind of the general rule. Anytime, every That's time a new friend deception. comes to see, yeah, they tell them we have to be careful about this precious table. It's the thing I get taken the mickey out of about the most by my own children. And there's a lot of material to work with, believe me. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the classic <laughs> eBay, isn't it? I mean, we've all had, especially in the early days of eBay, we've all had things arrive that were like a tenth of the size of how you imagined they were going to be. Like, you know, the, this incredibly, um, this farmhouse table that turns out to be one that goes into like a doll's house. So yeah. strictly speaking, they haven't actually deceived you, but they kind of have. I had some, I think I had something that was like a, a print. I can't remember what it was now. I, thought, I think it was a map. And I just had an idea based on the photos of the size it was going to be. And when it came, it really was like a postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> I did see a post from somebody. Um, I don't think it was in UKCBC, another book club the other day. And somebody had ordered a book trolley and it fitted in the palm of the hand. Oh, it yeah. Ordered, you know, like a three-day yeah. book trolley on wheels. No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's really that. naughty, isn't it? I, honestly, I don't know how people can sleep at night. Um, you know, I think they, sometimes they, they... we just haven't read descriptions properly, but, yeah, the young lad who sold me mine really saw me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a natural copywriter. Ooh. <laughs> I really fell in love with the idea of this family table. It's got hair dye and pen and all sorts on it now. It's really not very fancy at all, but they're never going to let me get rid of it. No, no, no. that's going to be an heirloom that you'll one day have to sell on eBay <laughs> with a story of your own. <laughs> um, I was talking to a friend of mine, Guy, earlier on, and we were saying about how um, the whole overnight success thing. So how long did it take you to become an overnight success? <laughs> Let's put some perspective in it for anyone watching oh who's my God. to write something. Well, I think and you've that, worked bloody hard. I mean, yeah, you've been oh my God. At this. Yeah, yeah, I really have. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I, I really do believe that I have worked very hard. And I have, mm. I've had, um, I did have, I think the overnight success that people think I experienced was after our house. Yeah. Um, because I hadn't, I had been very under the radar. So people, lots of readers hadn't heard of me at all. And they thought that was my first book. And so they were very flatteringly saying, this is an amazing debut even though it was actually like my 11th book or something. And I had actually learned my craft um, by then. Um, so that was 2018, I think that came out. Um, and I my first book was published in, two, in, in 2004. So 14 years it took to be an overnight success, I think. Um, but having said that, I mustn't. I, I, I feel a bit bad um, f towards my previous publishers because actually I had had some success yeah. in the noughties. I'd had um, a couple of books had been in the top fifty. I mean, they weren't in the top ten, but you know, it was still um, they still sold pretty well. And one was a really big seller, a book called um, "Since I Don't Have You." Right. It was set in Santorini in Greece and was actually a you know, really sad tale about a mother who's bereaved and she just leaves, ups and leaves and starts again, not knowing anyone in this little cave house um, in Ia in Santorini. And that was a, unexpectedly a big hit and sold, you know, sort of lots of copies. Oh, I have lost. I was enjoying myself then. And then all of a sudden, Louise has disappeared. Well, that's a good sign, isn't it? We managed to get 40 minutes in. So I'm, I'm hoping you can all still see me um, and that it's not just an issue on my laptop. 
if anyone can tell me that you can still see me. And hopefully we'll have Louise back in a moment. What a thing to happen. It's always me. It's always me that it happens to. Um, so I have been... Oh, you can still see me. Hello. Thank you. I'll just sit here and talk to myself. So um, I've got such good questions. I'm so pleased with the questions for this interview as well. And now this absolutely just disappeared. Oh, here we go. Let's see. I'm back. Thank you, Hi. everyone, for letting me know that you could see me. I wasn't sure if it was me or if it was, yeah. Anyway, where were we? <laughs> Hang on a second. Um, Can you hear me? Oh, gosh. Oh. Love it when things like this happen. Anybody else got any suggestions for who could play any of the characters in um, in any of Louise's books? I would be interested to hear. And the thing is, I'm ridiculous. You all know I rewatch the same stuff over and over. I hardly ever know who any of the actors are. I knew who Martin Constant was because of Line of Duty. Um, and Monarch of the Glen, I believe. That was a while ago as well. Can you see me? Hello. Hi. I can. Oh, good. I, that was so <laughs> weird. Because I could see you, but I disappeared. And then I went back in, but somehow I had had it going in two different windows. This is very boring um, tech explanation. <laughs> anyway, I'm back and I'm really sorry about that. Obviously, something That's happened. Okay. And... So can't where were what we? were saying. Well, can't you remember you what... were talking about the book set in Santorini. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I was just saying that um, actually, um, to be fair to, to my other publishers and also to a lot of readers mm. long-term readers um there you know there was some success early on and i'm you know so i have no idea <laughs> what on earth is going on while i've um got you all for a minute we are looking at um next not next weekend the weekend after we have a cozy fest so more details of that will be released soon um, we also have our event in June for anyone who hasn't bought tickets yet. Um, I believe we are on our website is ukcrimebookclub.com, could be .co.uk. I'm not sure. I will have a look. And I'm just popping Louise back in. Hello. Hi. I don't know what's going on. Honestly, it's just <laughs> no idea. dropping dropping out every so often. But it's great that we've had 40 minutes um but let's let fingers crossed we can continue but i'm really sorry I'd, I, I haven't had this before so i don't think it's my um wi-fi is normally quite good but um i dread to think let's yeah not let's it. yeah let's carry on <laughs> so um you'd had success before and one of the questions i wanted to ask you was about the um the covers because you've had translations in different countries and you, you've had lots of great covers. Do you have a favourite? I realise it's a really unfair question because there's so many to choose from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, covers are, um, you know, always a real struggle. Well, not always, but mostly a real struggle. Mm. And often, you know, they take up an enormous amount of time and they're quite hard to get right. And it really depends on if you've already got an established brand look it tends to be a bit easier to continue. But if you're... Which you have now with the domestic psychological thrillers. You yes, have. yeah, absolutely. I've had quite a lot of changes in, in my cover look. And the only suspect is, is a change again. Um, and, you know, it's quite a journey to, to get to the point of, of that being um, finalised. But I actually love that cover. So that's one of my favourites. Mm. But I think my all-time favourite cover of my books is um, The Other Passenger. Um, because I just thought it was such a clever design. Um, you know, you really got that sense of, um, for those who, who don't know it off the, top of the, off, off the top of their heads, it's got almost quite a vintage-y look and you're looking yeah. through, the, through um, the window from inside a boat and you can see the Thames and you can see the Shard and you can, so you've got, you get in this instant mood of the river, um, but also, um, you know, something that's quite, that's got quite a sort of, um, you know, noir mood to it. It doesn't, I mean, it is a contemporary book set in, mm. in the present day, but, you know, it could be, it could be earlier. 
Um, and no, I really loved it. And and also um, it, the original cover was green. And then we later um, put out a blue paperback and it was, and I loved both of those colorways. So that would be my favorite, but I do really like The Only Suspect and it has kind of echoes of that, which I wanted. Mm. Um, you know, you're, you're looking through um, the window of a, of a black cab. I think it probably is, although you know, it could just be a car. Um, and there's a, there, there are quite a few key scenes set in um, in cars in the book. Um, there's one that where um, Rick and Marina are driving across, I think Waterloo Bridge, in this kind of spirit of escape from their various situations. And you know, to me, that's one of the key scenes in the book. And then a little bit later, um, Marina's going to her to her house to pick up um, some um, some of her things and Rick's waiting for her and he's sitting smoking out the window. And um, yeah, so the car, to me, the car was a really, it was kind of an iconic thing in the book. Um, and, you know, we'd had a lot of houses on, on, on my covers before because, you know, I'm obviously associated with um, domestic um, noir and our house, et cetera, um, and horrible neighbors. Um, and so it was quite nice to to have um, you have a car rather than a house. Um, so that would be my favourite. But some of the some of the covers I get um, on my foreign editions are mind blowing. I mean, they're they're wild. Some of them, you know, they you'd never in a million years have imagined that there would be a cover like that for for, <laughs> for a book. I had one of my books which was called The Second Husband, which was basically like a kind of domestic early domestic noir with it almost like Lolita, like a retelling of Lolita, but from the the, the mother's point of view. Um, the the Dutch had this edition where they had the they had wrists sort of tied with, with red rope or something. I mean, it was just so bizarre. It was it back in the um, kind of Fifty Shades of Grey era. And <laughs> they were trying to make it seem like it might have an erotic theme um, in there. Um, so yeah, there there have been some really interesting ones, and of course the the ones set in houses, they you know there'll be a Dutch house or a French apartment building or a you know an Italian house. They won't look like you know the um, the, the house that's described in the book at all. But you know I would I would never argue with a with a um, a foreign publisher. I mean they know their market. I obviously don't know it at all. So, and it's lovely when you see them all and all the different fonts and things. It's really fascinating. I'm always really fascinated by how discreet covers are in some markets because our, our covers in the UK are really in your face. You know, you've got bold and neon colours for the type and, you know, big letters. And, you know, you, you've got a sort of at a glance idea of what that book is. But on the continent, some of them are, are a lot more subtle and the titles, you know, tiny <laughs> I can barely see it with my eyesight. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about was influences. Obviously, you've mentioned Hitchcock, but I saw on your website the hashtag Be More Jackie. Oh, really? Um, but Jackie Collins, that's um that's um SNS's author and their rebranding of Jackie Collins, who I do love. Um and um but I wouldn't say she was an influence on okay. me directly. I do love Jackie Collins. And actually, now I think about it, maybe everyone I read when I was younger is an influence because I, she was one of those authors that I would save their book to when, you know, the exam period was over. Jackie Collins, Jilly Cooper, all of, all of those, you know, kind of real um, thick doorstop books with loads of sex and adventure and glamorous places but I'm not sure whether I see any of Jilly or Jackie in my work I think I'm much more influenced in that respect by um, someone like um, Agatha Christie or um, Patricia Highsmith would be right up there also Tom Wolfe he's probably my mm -hmm. favorite author um, contemporary author um, and, um, you know, whenever I reread a Tom Wolfe, because we have, we didn't have very many novels from him. He was, I think we had about one every decade, didn't we, before he died. Bonfire of the Vanities being the, the, um, the most famous one. But whenever I reread even a single passage of Tom Wolfe, I just get reminded of how amazing it is to be a writer and the energy he brought to, you know, it was, his writing is muscular. It's just sort of multidimensional. 
and all of the onomatopoeia and, you know, just the kind of vibrancy of language. And so, um, so he's been a big influence. Um, and then in terms of the only suspect, the biggest influence is Barbara Vine. Mm. Um, who, of course, is um, it was a pseudonym for Ruth Rendell. Her some more of her psychological books, and um, I'd been listening to a dramatization of um, a Fatal Inversion um, late one night. I couldn't sleep, and it was on Radio Four Extra, um, and I just listened to the whole thing, and you know, was completely riveted by it. And I actually hadn't read any Barbara Vine at that point, even though her name had often been brought up in interviews with me and people had, uh, had asked me if I'd been influenced because there were likenesses and I didn't think anything of it. And then, um, but I woke up the next day after, after listening to this play and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a story where secrets from a hedonistic past come back to haunt grown-up people. Um, and, um, and I started reading Barbara Vines and, oh my God, within... Within about five pages, I realized how incredibly flattered I'd been by <laughs> these um, these comparisons in, in interviews because um, those books are masterpieces and um, A Dark Adapted Eye is has got to be one of the best books ever written. It's just an incredible it, book. So oh, my God. Go. It's so good. It's the way – it's just a, an absolute master at work, this seamless, apparently seamless – moving back and forth in time um and you know no no kind of um subtitles for the for the reader you know you're not told oh now you're back in the 30s and now you're now you're here and now you're there and now you're mm. now you're now is it's now and 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 you're back again it's all you you just have to play catch up you just have to figure it out for yourself and it's just so fantastic um, so yes, um, a fatal inversion um, was a, was a real influence on this book, and it really is a wonderful book. Um, and you know, if you read it, you'll think, "Well, what's she talking about?" It really is just that central idea of um, you know secrets being buried, and um, you're not you're never quite sure what happened in the past, and you only really figure it out in the present day. And you know, the way guilt um, can haunt you. Um, and, you know, there's a line in The Only Suspect where Alex, who has been harboring guilt for 25 years, you know, comes to the conclusion that he, he wished he just, you know, confessed at the time. He wished he'd just, you know, been honest at the time because then at this stage in the game, he would be living his life as a free man in his own mind. And he he might, have, might have spent time in prison. Well. But, yeah, I mean, it's just... It, it, freedom comes in and and you know incarceration comes in lots of forms doesn't it mm. it might be physical incarceration but it also might be might be you know psychological and that's what he's been suffering so um so yeah i found that really fascinating theme to explore yeah secrets lies um the relationships and how it's really interesting to watch how relationships change as kind of paranoia creeps in and all these different outside influences and that the, the detail that you go into with it's so light and delicate but it speaks volumes it's so clever oh thank you that's a lovely compliment that's what I'm trying to do I really do aim to um be very clear um but without going into too much sort of detail to bog mm. bog readers down I mean I'm really conscious now and when I look back at my earlier writing you know it was a lot more detailed that I just think um we're up for a pacier read now and um ideally you know sort of scenes or shorter chapters I think that there aren't very many people willing to sit down with a you know a very dense bit of literature anymore um, you know, and it's still there if if that's what we want. But you know, mm. authors are competing with incredible TV. We're competing with the gaming industry. We're com you know we're competing with quite a lot of stuff, and um, and so I try and I try and make it a fluent and energetic experience if I can. But I've always loved you know that the elegance of you know the phrase making side of writing as well. So I want it to sound good as well as be, um, you know, a plot-driven experience. Now, nobody needs to cover their ears. We're not going to give any spoilers for anything. But um, just before we went live, we were talking about um, Happy Valley. 
and um, I've watched recently, um, I think it's called The Light in the Hall. I don't know why. Oh, yes, I'm I saw that. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that's very, very good. Um, and, um, you know, not sort of, not a big budget thing at all. It was on Channel yeah. 4, wasn't it? Um, and now, of course, I can't remember any of the actors' names, but it's got a... a no, my mind's gone blank. Yeah, yeah. Is it Joanna Scanlon? possibly yes. is the main yeah, yeah. character um but She's yeah for those who one. haven't yeah. seen it i really urge you to watch it you can see it on all four um and it really is good it's really got an excellent plot yeah. and yeah it's about a, a a mother whose daughter um disappeared uh, many years ago mm. and yes and yeah it's i mean it's a it's a classic sort of crime trope isn't it but in this yeah. particular interpretation it's re it's quite subtle and i and I normally can guess um, who did it and why they did it quite early on because I've just got the plotting brain and you know I, I think well what would I do if yeah. um, if I if I'd written this um, but I didn't guess it and you know that's a that's a real compliment I guess I normally pride myself on being able to guess it but I didn't I didn't guess I started to have an inkling quite late on I certainly didn't guess. I think on. the inkling was exactly when, and I forget what the writer's name is. I recently um, looked her up and found something else that she'd written and watched that as well. Um, I think it is it Regina from... Moriarty. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Here's you saying you can't remember things. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's only because I, I recently chatted about her with um, the producer who's working on the, the swimming pool. Oh, okay. Um, and can, she, had, um, she had suggested that I watch the light in the hall and I'll tell you what else is really good that I'm watching and again um with a with a book um connection is um the catch tm logan's latest okay. adaptation Haven't that's another good it. one to watch yeah that's on channel five and it's really good and I can remember the cast's name that's the star <laughs> of that is Jason Watkins and he is absolutely excellent um, and again, yeah, it's secrets, it's secrets coming back to haunt people. And, you know, it's a really fantastic device for thriller writers because, mm. um, you know, we, there has to be a, a true psychological sort of grounding for crazy decisions. And, you know, that, that, that moment when, you know, the audience or the reader saying, why didn't you just go to the police? You know, they've got to, there's got to be a proper psychological reason yeah. why you haven't done that. And, um, because it and, can fall so flat otherwise, can't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They've got to be. They've got to be proper reasons. Um, and you know, for instance, in our house, um, Bram's spiral of of wrong decisions. You know, it's all based on this phobia he has of of going to prison. Mm -hmm. And as someone who has phobias myself, and my regular readers will know that I love a phobia. You know, you have you develop safety behaviours. You will go out of your way to avoid the thing that you fear yeah. um, even if it looks like you are completely crazy to the people you're with um, and it's you know a, a, a normal sane person would not make that decision but if you have a phobia you are you are um, making your decisions based on a completely different motivation so um, so yeah um, two there two very good um, drama recommendations there both really good the catch and the light in the hall how much do you think writers can learn from the cross of disciplines? So earlier on, you mentioned um, script writing and learning different things about, you know, seeing your own writing from a different point of view. But there must be so many little things that cross over and some things that are absolute no-nos probably for each one as well that you wouldn't touch. But then that's learning something as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so much crossover. I mean, the, the first and obvious thing is... You know, some writers um, are brilliant. Some novelists are brilliant at dialogue. And, you know, it's obvious straight away. And and some writers love dialogue. I'm one of those who I absolutely love dialogue. And it, I really, you know, take great pains to try and make my characters sort of speak in a naturalistic way rather than as if it's been written by a professional author kind of way. Um, and so I really, um, you know, I, I, I thought that I would, be, I would be able to cross over into the discipline of screenwriting quite naturally. But there's so much else beyond the, the dialogue. It's the structuring of an episode as opposed to a whole book. Mm. Um, and so I'd say that what I have learned from the experience is, um, is pacing 
really, because my books tend to be a very slow burn and then things pick up and you get often the final final third, maybe the second half, will be just full of plot and full of um, excitement. But the first half has probably been a bit slower and you're meeting everyone and you're starting, you know, I want people to start to have suspicions and I'm planting things and seeding things. And you can do that in a novel because, you know, you 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 hope that the, the reader has faith that you'll deliver, even if, you know, there, there might not be someone, you know, driving a, a car off a cliff at the end of chapter two. Um, and so, but in TV, it's, you can't do that. You, you need beats and there and you know you, you'll write an episode on the basis that there will be there'll be commercial breaks and so you might have you know four four parts and you'll need a you'll need a, um, a hook at the end of uh, every commercial break um, and so you know I found that just really fascinating discipline um, and it did make me think oh okay maybe I need to have another look at how I structure my novels but the other thing that I I think I love most about books have and hadn't realized what a wonderful luxury it was compared to writing for the screen is all of those meta elements and the narrative trickery it's just works so much better on the page so you know it was really interesting in when our house was adapted by the brilliant screenwriter Simon Ashdown the first thing he did was he got rid of all of those those devices that I had. So no one was giving a podcast interview. No one was tweeting. No one was sitting writing a confession on his laptop. Um, it, you know, all of those meta elements were immediately eliminated and it's pure drama. So a dramatization is just a, a different beast um, from a novel telling experience. But both have their strengths and it's just made me appreciate, you know, the sort of the respective strengths, I think. We have got about a minute left. Oh my God, we That's have, really wow. Fun. So, um, are there any questions anyone's asking that, that we've we kind of covered address? most things? Um, yes, the Cozy Fest will be on YouTube. I, I was just rambling when, um, when you disappeared briefly. I was rambling for a minute about different things that I thought of at the time. Oh, well so, done. Um, <laughs> I actually could hear you. That's the oh, right, okay. thing. But yeah, I disappeared, but you didn't disappear. So I could hear you um, um, in the background. We were still connected, even though I dropped into the abyss briefly. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Thank yes, you to thank you, you for everyone. coming and talking to me. Do you want to give everyone a recap of The Only Suspects? Absolutely. Why is it, are you seeing it back to front like me? No. No, no okay. we have a button on here where we can ah, move the camera. Okay, so no. right. Um, yes, please enjoy it. It's a, a, a twisty noirish tale, and if you um, remember the '90s or you um, are fascinated by the '90s, then I think that it will be, you know, it, it'll be the book for you. Um, and then maybe read um, Barbara Vine, A Fatal Inversion, um, as well, and, and let me know if I have my homage has um, done her justice. I think I'll um, try and forget most of the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> You're much too young. You look too young to have been around in the 90s. Oh, I was in, no, I was definitely there. Were you? Okay. A fellow oh, no, survivor. The 80s, <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Just turned 41. So, yeah, definitely was around oh, in the 90s. Okay. So, you would have been, what, a, like an early teen or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what a great time with the Spice Girls <laughs> as your role models. <laughs> Oh, I was posh. Oh, I bet you were. Yeah, you do kind of have a look, actually. Is that what? So did oh, is that what girls did? Because I was too old. I mean, I loved the Spice Girls, but I was in you my twenties. Too old? No, oh, no, no. I, you're never too old for Spice Girls. But I was, yeah. I was going to say, in school, did you all um, give yourselves um, a Spice Girl, um, you know, role? Yes, and I won't, I, I won't out any of my friends from yeah. them by saying. <laughs> But yeah, oh my god, oh the dancing. Oh, oh my god, say oh, you'll be there, say you'll be you. there is my favorite. <laughs> that video was so fantastic. And on that note, I'll say a final thank you, and I look forward to um, you coming back to talk about the next book. Yeah, I'd which love we haven't to. Briefly, we haven't mentioned at all, no. so just briefly, no. um, tell us about the next no. one. <laughs> I'm not going to say too much, but what I will say is that it's back into the world of property. 
um, but a holiday home um, backdrop. Mm. So I'm leaving London, believe it or not. I'm leaving London for my next book. Thank you so much. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for, for watching. <laughs>